earth did you find this 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 retro theater? They're only playing films from the 1970s. Magnificent, isn't it? Eh? Not bad. Yeah. I think. I think. Unfortunately, I think they made the popcorn in the 1970s Ooh, as well. It does. So taste. it is a little bit, mm. a little bit stale and rubbery. Very, but buttery, but buttery all the same. You have to take, have to take the rough with the smooth. Oh my god! <laughs> I, people used to talk about. Um, or people still do talk about how, like the 1970s was like the last golden age of Hollywood cinema. I first came across this idea in like the 1990s, and I remember yeah. at the time kind of thinking, you know, really, how, how does anyone figure that? Why? Why was the 70s the golden age? It was just all bad haircuts and bad trousers. But, yeah. um, but looking back on it now, kind of there is something kind of quite unique and you know, subversive and fascinating about that 1970s era of kind of mainstream Hollywood films. There, there were a lot of you know interesting films made then that you would never possibly see a, like a mainstream mm-hmm. studio spend a whole load of money on these days. Yeah. It was a kind of a strange, interesting time. Um, and I was kind of, I was thinking, oh, we should talk about this at the popcorn counter, but how, how can we, how can we get away in? So I, I reckoned, um, we could sit back in these in these kind of velvet chairs here and try and come up with an an A to Z of Hollywood cinema of the nineteen seventies. Oh God, who gets Q? Because, so I've and I and or X. You know, I I did speak to you about. Oh <laughs> man, did I get I got all the crappy letters. Oh, man. <laughs> I've already taken A, okay. so I've done. I did a little bit of homework. All right, we but, got. Um, so we we have given out letters, but I'm not completely sure what you're going to do for your letters. I'm not sure you know what I'm going to do for my letters actually. Yeah. So. Um, so we may end up doing the same films. Let's find out. Yeah. I, but I've, got to, I've selfishly sucked up A, yeah. uh, which means that you have to do Z. Good yeah. luck with that. Because no, they're Let's, 26. Um, mm. so, but I, so, so I'm going to start with A. Yep. For A is A. So this is okay, the ABC of Hollywood cinema of the yeah. 1970s. A is four. And I was spoiled for choice. I could have had Alien. Uh, yeah, I guess. But I went, I, went, I went for Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, 1979, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, which, and it's like, you know, I feel like we started at the top. It's, you know, we've talked about this before, haven't we, on the popcorn counter? It's chaotic and anti-authoritarian, anti-establishment. It's it's nihilistic yeah, um, and morally ambiguous, but at the same yeah. time kind of stylish and fascinating. And it's sprawling and it's kind of impressionistic. And you know, it's it's a beautiful mess. And it's, you know, impossible now to imagine anybody... Um, you know, pitching Apocalypse Now Oof. to, a, uh, to a, you know, a big studio and them saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, we'll make your weird hallucinatory yeah. nightmare about Vietnam. Uh, Francis, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll spend I think it's $31 million, something like that, an enormous amount of money at the time on this you know, utterly crazy film. Yeah. And I feel like that kind of sets the tone for the whole of 70s cinema. What, what have you got for B? Well, it comes Come at the end. I mean, just a couple of things on Apocalypse Now. It's just 70s yep. excess comes to mind. Um, and then there's the Redux, which came out maybe 2006, 7, 8, which added about 13 minutes to it. And I think it it's really interesting, the the minutes that they added. So, I, I mean, I, I've always loved that film. I, I can watch it again and again. But um, it's, there's I'm, an I'm even longer to, version, yeah. I'm ashamed to say I've never seen it in a cinema. I've only seen oh. it at home. And I imagine seeing like a proper 70 mil print yeah. you know, in an enormous theatre yeah. with the sound turned way up. It must be just a, a you know, a, an overloading sensory experience. Yeah. The, I've seen it a number of times. You do have a point. Maybe the only time I saw it on, uh, in a cinema was the Redux. And I think it was at BFI on the South Bank there. So, uh, huh. Interesting. Um, I'm going to, st- you've given me a great list here and I'm just going to make it work. Warren Beatty for B. B is for uh, Beatty. Warren, Warren Beatty. Beatty. But, uh, so Beatty or Beatty? Beatty. Beatty. Warren Beatty. Beatty. It's Warren Beatty, isn't it? Beatty. Yeah. Did I say Beatty? We're not going to have, we're gonna, no. we're not, I hope we're not going to have no, translate, right. translate all over again. Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks. Tom, Tom, <laughs> Warren Beatty. So, I, mean, I, I see, I, I think of the 70s and I think of Warren Beatty. Yeah. Well, um, well, I think this is like big actors, big leading men, big leading women. That's how I think of the 70s in part. And uh, it seems like they had a monopoly on, on, on the big parts and the big films. Um, Shampoo is, I think, the 1970s with Julie Christie. Star power was an important part of yeah, like that kind of Hollywood 70s. Getting stuff made, yeah, because it's pretty big budgets. But stars who didn't make safe choices. Um, so, yeah, Warren Beatty made some, yeah. like, some very interesting films, yeah. actually. I loved Heaven Can Wait. Which is, I think, Hal Ashby, maybe. I think maybe it is. Uh, maybe it is. 
I hate. Well, shampoo is definitely Hal Ashby. Um, right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, Heaven can wait. I think McCabe and Miss, Mrs. Miller, which is maybe late '60s. Actually, it's a Robert Altman film, but around that right, time, yeah, it's as well. definitely Altman. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the, I, the Parallax View, isn't it? It's like the film I always think of, which um, really fits in with Three Days at the Condor. Again, it has that yeah. kind of that sort of spy story paranoia. Um, yeah. So you know, these were not you know a whole load of safe choices. What do you see for C? <sighs> so for C, I have put down um, Close Encounters. Mm. Uh, which was uh, the first Spielberg movie that I ever saw. Um, Richard Dreyfuss, yeah. um, Francois Truffaut, amazingly. I mean, I remember you know, not yes. understanding why this weird French guy was in the film and, yeah. you know, and didn't seem to speak any English. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember seeing that at the local Odeon. And I must have been yeah. kind of like really young, like kind of seven or eight years old, something like that. And being like really, really overwhelmed by this film. And the enormous soundscape that it involved and yeah. then the enormous spaceship at the end. Yep. And again, there's something which just feels quite anti-establishment about Close Encounters, isn't it? It's, um, you know, there's this kind of distrust of the government still, although there is kind of like there is sort of a government department, but they're, they're kind of you know run by this French guy who mm -hmm. wants to speak to the aliens. It's kind of hallucinatory and weird again, isn't it? It's, yeah. um, you know, a big, overwhelming film. Yeah, amazing that this this because this, this was Spielberg's third feature, wasn't it? Is that right? He made Duel, then he made Jaws, and then he went straight on to Close Encounters after oh, Jaws. Right? Yeah, you know, and this is you know, this is a big, remarkable, interesting, ambitious, and and you know, quite sort of druggy, weird film. I would love to see it again. I have not seen it for many, many mm. years. Actually, that also got a re-release, didn't it? Whether he added some extra footage. Now, I remember going back to the cinema to see that as well and remembering the first version well enough that I could spot what the extra footage was. Oh, really? It made a big impression on me when I was very little, that film. What what you got for D, then? I'm a little confused because for B, it was Warren Beatty with a B, his last name. D is Dennis Hopper. D is his <laughs> first name. Hmm. I'll allow that. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, Dennis allowed. Hopper. Well, I'm glad we talked about Dennis Hopper or we will talk about him because I'm going to pre-lap a little bit because I know what your E is. Um, <laughs> he's sort of a late 60s film. He's uh, got quite a role um, in a quintessential motorcycle film, cross-country road trip and emphasize on the trip, trip, trip. <laughs> Um, but then he sort of ends the seventies with a wonderfully Hopper character in Apocalypse Now. He plays the photographer. Right, who's yes, he is a, in Apocalypse yeah, Now, isn't he? He's become sort of an apostle of uh, the Marlon Brando character, um, and it's just it's appropriately weird. Of course, it's Vietnam era, Vietnam era, so um, he fits right in. Um, but Dennis Hopper, whose career really goes back to the fifties, he's in Giant with um, uh, ah, Liz I've Taylor. Never seen that, oh know. my God! And yeah, yeah, and. Um, Jimmy Dean, uh, James Dean. Um, yeah, so um, he's a man who I think really spans the 70s very well. He's obviously in a number of films in that era, but um, something sort of right at the beginning, of a film that you might talk about next that kicks off the the decade and then, of course, Apocalypse Now, The Big Beast at the end of the decade. But what, what's your E? Maybe it's, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's no relationship. Uh, well, oh, okay, so I, I... Right, okay, I think you think I'm going to put Easy Rider <sighs> for E, and I, I'm not going... To. I think I thought about Easy Rider mm, and okay, um, okay. it turns out it was made in 1969. I yeah, thought it exactly. was made in 1970. It was 1969. So for E, I'm going to say The Exorcist. Mm. Oh, my God, yeah. By, uh, William Freakin. Um, so, yeah, originally based on the model, novel by uh, William Peter Blatty. It was you know, for a while, like, this is one of the biggest grossing films of all time, wasn't it? I mean, it had an astonishing cinema run yeah. and you know, genuinely terrifying film. It's still terrifying today, even though you know, the religious sentiment um, that that uh, is responsible for quite a lot of the horror of the film is, you know, is these days yeah. you know, not largely a part of everyday life. Um, the thing that's most terrifying, I think, about The Exorcist, I think if you ask most people, the most frightening thing that most people remember is the medical intervention that she has where they put a central line in uh, while she has a... So she has like a brain scan, doesn't she? Mm. And they have to put this... Uh, like they have to put a needle in her neck, basically, yeah. which is something that I used to do pretty regularly Oof. on a, like a weekly basis. I don't do them very regularly these days, but right. I used to do it on a regular kind of weekly basis. Um 
but I think most people find that the most terrifying moment of the film, sticking this you know genuine big shiny medical needle into somebody's neck. Yeah, um, there is a kind of bit of body horror there. Yeah, you know, um, I think we should remind our listeners that you're a doctor at this time. <laughs> Yes, this this is my yes. This is this is part of that. So, not not the Canadian serial killer uh, alter ego. Yeah. This is the this is the real me. You're doing yes. this less regularly in hospitals than you used to. Do. <laughs> I was even being paid for it. And everything. Yeah, honestly, honestly, it was Oof, all right. I got scared. Um, uh, William Freakin sounds you know like another quintessentially seventies director as far as yeah. you know, utterly you know, unpredictable uh, uh, wild card. Yeah. Um, slightly terrifying guy. I remember we were um, we had a lecture from a guy who used to work with William, William Freakin when we were together in film school. Yeah, um, and I can't remember what picture it was that he was working with William Freakin on, but he had all sorts of great stories about how no matter what he wrote, um, you know they would they would throw it out and he would be forced to write it again yeah, and again. again. And they'd meet him day after day in this same blooming hotel room and they. would write loads of pages and then throw them away again. And it was you know, absolutely terrifying and, and draining. Did Friedkin direct the French connection that starts with an F? French connection? He did. Uh-huh. He did. Oh, what a segue. You're going to have French connection for F. No. I'm sticking, <laughs> I'm sticking to the script. But I think maybe you would talk about it a little bit with G. I don't know why. G. G in French is G. What, what are you going to put for F then? Five. You're teasing me now. Five easy pieces. Mm. I'm following the script. Um... With uh, Jack Nicholson, and another, we talked about like the big actor, big actresses. Um, Karen Black was in almost every film in the nineteen seventies, and she was the big <laughs> la- leading lady. And uh, I always wondered about that because I never thought she was a great actress, but um, a great actor, I should say. Um, but she was everywhere. She was. People must have loved working with her, or loved what she brought to the screen because uh. she, she was cast a lot. Um, five easy pieces. I love that role uh, for Jack Nicholson. It just seems so out of the ordinary for his um, choices um, and I love the scenes where he's in the back of this pickup truck playing the piano and then there was a it, it, it was reenacted in my life because I, I inherited this junky old piano that we were either going to put in the dumpster or the back of my <laughs> friend's pickup truck it actually landed we were just going to push it off the edge of this loading dock it actually went into the pickup truck so I ended up keeping it and then my friend jumped in the back and we were driving across town and he was playing in the back. Uh, it was just, uh, <laughs> this is real life. This is life imitating art. And your friend actually was Jack Nicholson. That's amazing. No. I I, I, so, so how did you get the piano in the pickup truck, though? Did you like physically lift it up with your hands? It was an upright piano. So we had four people. And his, it, it was perfectly parked next to a dumpster, which I think over there you call a... Oh. A skip. A skip. A skip. I that's knew what that. That's what it is in this country. So it didn't matter. It was a worthless old piano. We worked for an orchestra and they were trying to throw this thing away anyway. Um, but it was functional. It was, there was a lot of duct tape on it and holding it together. <laughs> so it was functional. So we thought, okay, if if it if we somehow drop it or something happens, we just push it into the dumpster, skip, or we can put it in the back of the pickup truck and I'll have a free piano. <laughs> So I ended up with a free piano. And somehow, for some reason, many years later, you've suffered with terrible back pain. N- no, no. If you get enough people, I mean, moving pianos is a paid job, by the way. I mean, people are paid to do it properly. We did it improperly. I've, I've, seen, I've seen a whole feature film about moving pianos. It was black and white uh, with uh, two guys trying to get a piano up a, a stairway. Oh, really? There's uh, Laurel and uh, who's that other guy? Okay. okay. Har- 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 <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. G. Go for it. Gee, um, what could be more 70s than Gene Hackman? Yeah. So, you, so you're right. French Connection does yeah. come up but under G. Yeah, yeah. William Freakin again. Oh, my God. G. Um, Gene Hackman's such a watchable actor. So the French Connection, yes. But the conversation, yes. He closed out the 70s with Superman. Um, and he's kind of like, you know, such a, a um, charismatic, tough guy. He's got a real anti-authoritarian again. It's why he fits in with that 70s vibe. He's kind of a real wild living ex-Marine. Yeah. Gene Hackman's kind of man's man. I looked him up this afternoon on, on Wikipedia and they call him Gene Hackman, actor and novelist. That's what he's written down as. I had no idea he's written novels. Is that right? I have no idea. He's. I know. I have no idea. He's sort of disappeared, right? I think he's retired and he's, t- he's laying low. Um, I didn't know that he was a novelist. 
I just but so many great films though. Absolutely, with a career like that, you have nothing to nothing to prove, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, okay. It's, it's, I feel like this is such a natural segue. Gene Hackman, G H. What have you got for H? Who these guys live together? Hoffman, Dustin. I think they were Dustin they were Hoffman. early. They lived together. Early apartment mates in New York City in that at that time. So that is a great story. That yeah. that feels like that's that feels like a, a sitcom in the making. Yeah, Gene Hackman, and Dustin that's Hoffman. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the Graduate, of course, which was probably 1969. So again, he's sort of Something, yeah. he's kind of kicking off the um, the era. But um, oh boy, I remember Marathon Man with uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier, who was oh, yeah. quite old at the time. And I remember hearing about how um, Olivier was ill. And there's this just one scene where they're sort of in like an interrogation. They're in close quarters. And uh, Hoffman wanted to get some energy. So he wanted to get up and run around the room a little bit to get into the characters. <laughs> and Olivier was not well and didn't want to do that. And he said something like, you know, because I think Hoffman was going um, uh, method on him. And Olivier <laughs> just sits there and says, that's why they call it acting. <laughs> Um, so he didn't need to do any of that nonsense. Um, but Hoffman, yeah. Um, oh God, I'm trying, I'm losing one film though. Oh God. New York City, he plays, um, a differently abled, he's living with, um, oh God, what is the name of the film? You're not talking about, um, uh, Rain Man. Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy? Oh, Midnight Cowboy. God, oh, yes. Nice. Oh, my God. Too hard to With find John that. Voight, isn't it? Is yeah, it, John, Voight. John Voight. Midnight I forgot Cowboy. the name of the film. I forgot the name of John Voight. I've forgotten everything. But um, Hoffman had a couple of obviously great roles at that time. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely a 70s character. And then I, I wonder if Kramer versus Kramer is right around the end of that decade with um, Meryl Streep, 79, 80, probably. I think um, so. Something like that. I think that's yeah. him closing out the Which sort of, you decade. Know, yeah, all the President's Men as well. Oh, God, Such there you a go. quintessentially there you 70s movie. There you go. Perfect. With, yeah. with Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, but he's playing second fiddle to Bob Redford, Sundance yeah. himself. So I'll pass that on then from there. Okay. After H, we get I. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I, 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 well, um, I'm going to pick... If, I'm so glad when I realized I had an eye for this invasion of the body snatches. Yeah. Hey. Oh, uh, 1978, Philip Kaufman. Um, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the translator, translator question. Is it yeah. Kaufman? Kaufman? How do you pronounce that? Is he American? Kaufman. I think he is, isn't he? Kauf, I would say. <coughs> Kaufman. 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 Philip Kaufman. 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 Okay. Kaufman. Um, I've, true to my uh, form, I've read the book. Yeah. Um, and the book is. Uh, kind of okay. Um, the book seems to. Have, I the main thing I remember about the book actually is a lot of kind of um, kind of uh, rather sexist observation of of hot chicks and and um, like the lead character is constantly talking about how how hot this woman he's meeting is. Yeah. It's, it's all kind of a bit weird and icky in nineteen fifties and strange. Yeah. Um, this nineteen seventy eight remake of the nineteen fifty six original. Yeah. Just awesome. Donald Sutherland, so fantastic. I remember watching it when I was quite young on, on telly because I found out that it had Leonard Nimoy in it. And so I quite wanted yeah. to watch a film with Spock Bark, yeah. in it. He's not in it a great deal, but he's good in it. Um, the final shot of this film is, yeah, one of the most terrifying shots in cinema. And and it's a shot that's commonly spoiled by the poster, isn't it? Or at least there are some posters or some images of the film which will spoil that final shot. But... Um, it's really richly metaphorical invasion of the body snatches. Again, it's about kind of paranoia and and alienation and like this nihilistic worry about the collapse of society. Yeah, yeah, great film, really, really great actually. But yeah, a bit of a downer. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever seen the whole film. <gasps> My, wow. my relationship well, you're in for a treat. Well, my relationship to it was that we used to get these little. Um, now they'd call them graphic novels, but we used to get these little school books. Scholastic actually would print up these books that were just using stills or film shots, um, and then they'd put in a l much less dialogue and tell the whole story. So I had this copy, and I remember I had to, I went down to, hey, you were in Disney World recently. Yeah. I went on this trip to Florida when I was about 10 years old. So it was on the airplane there and back. I was reading Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and it was just this little, you know, glossy printed book full color and so I, I read the book if there is a book or i read this sort of synopsis graphic novel and that's well, that's how i know the book yeah it's full of stills from the movie yeah i think so 
I think they took stills from the movie and... I mean, what I'm imagining here is like one of those little golden books, like, you know, like a sort of like a 16-page hardback with big, colourful pictures and it like was, two it, lines of text on each page. It was probably four, 40 or 50 pages with, you know, three or four, four, four to six panels on each page, something like that. So it looked like a, a comic book, but it was photographic. And this this was aimed at teenagers or like or like I don't know what I think, or like kind of eight and nine year olds or did you ever get these little catalogs in elementary school or primary school where you could choose books that they were trying you know they're a buck oh, piece yeah. or something like that I think we sent away for a pile of books and I think I got the cat from outer space and I got uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers oh my god and it, yeah it seemed so totally inappropriate but it was yeah, that I, is totally it, inappropriate it kind of scared me I didn't want to see the film so maybe that's still. <laughs> Clicking away in my mind. Another another well, thing I never wanted. Yay for the seventies. That's yeah, what I say. Yeah. I mean, it was scary, and, it, and it's something similar. Jaws. J. J for Jaws. Oh yes. Same same sort of thing. Like it made me never want to swim in the ocean again. Um, Second appearance for Spielberg yeah. in, the, in the alphabet. Yeah, and I've gone back and I've seen that film. You know, not so many years ago, and I think I really liked it a lot more. Um, when I saw it more recently, there's this one scene, especially when Robert Shaw is just telling this story about. I think it's a war story when. All these uh, paratroopers are just dropping into the ocean, and the sharks are just coming around and eating them all up. And um, the the it's very uh, eerie. The boat is creaky. You know, the boat is not safe. You're already thinking the shark could jump onto this boat at any moment. The music is pretty intense, and Robert Shaw is super intense. And there are Scheider and and um, oh good Dreyfus are sitting around, you know, completely wrapped, listening to him. And it's just this wonderful scene because it's so scary. And all it is is he's telling a story. So it's just very, it's kind of anti-cinematic, but Spielberg actually does a pretty good job of making it really intense just with music, sounds of the boat, and just the expectation that, you know, that shark's right around them somewhere. So, uh, yeah, and we're starting to see great white sharks here a little bit. Um, so oh. I'm, I'm careful again in the water, but I mean... I was going to say, yeah, when was the last time you were in the ocean? Uh, last fall, probably. I haven't been in the, this year, but yeah. Oof. Anyway, um, Oof. that takes Oof. you to K. That's a hard, K. That's a hard letter. Uh, uh, well, uh, it would be until you realise that K is for Kubrick, Ooh. Stanley Kubrick. I, I'm not sure whether I'd say he did his absolute best work in the 1970s because I, I think his best work is 2001, which was 68, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. I think uh, so right. I had to look up exactly what his 70s films were. They were A Clockwork Orange, yep. um, Barry Lyndon, mm-hmm. and then The Shining was filmed in the 70s, released in 1980. Yeah. Um, you know, Clockwork Orange, um, very much about a film about you know, the end of society. Yep. Um, uh, Barry Lyndon, you know, beautiful film, but kind of detached, cynical, kind of ironic. You know, and then The Shining again, you know, all about disintegration, alienation, more about the disintegration of the self than of society. But still, as a trio, those three have a you know a pretty seventies take on life and society as a whole. Um, yeah, you know, three impressive films. You know, I mean, you know, he never really made a dud. Those, you know, yeah. those three are great. Clockwork Orange famously could not be seen in the UK for many, many years. You know, Kubrick just stopped it being released. I think, you know, he, he owned all of his films, didn't he? Mm-hmm. And just um, licensed them out. So he simply wouldn't license it to a UK distributor because he was so frightened of its effect on youths. Yeah. Uh, so we had to go to Paris to see it. I think we went on a holiday to Paris in like in... Well, when would this have been? Like in the mid '90s, I think was the first time I saw a Clockwork Orange, uh, and I can clearly remember the cinema, and it was very similar to the one we're sitting in now. Actually, oh, rather, really, yes, very sort of down at heel, and you know, a lot of kind of velvet and um, red curtains, and you know, you know, a nice but very old cinema. The yeah. cinema was you know, at least the same age as the movie. Um, but yeah, K is for Kubrick. Everyone knows that K is for Kubrick. What have you got for L? Uh, I'm going to go off script, I think. I'm going to go way off script. <laughs> oh, good. Um, <laughs> a bit like the 70s, it smell in themselves. Yeah. yeah, you gave me David Lynch here, but I'm not a Lynch fan. In fact, the only film that I liked of his, I think, is a we can We can no longer film, be friends, so. you realize. Yeah, so I think maybe I'll stray away from that. Eraserhead, you say, was 1977. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I want, to, I want to hear your alternative L. What, 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 what were you going to choose for L? <laughs> I don't know if this is even an L, but then again, you've got some pretty loose uh, characterizations oh, yeah. here. Um, 
I'm going to go with Dino De Laurentiis. Laurentiis. Is, oh. he, is he a D? He's a DL. He's on the DL. That's the down low. Yeah, he's an L. He's an but, L. I'll buy that. Absolutely. Massive, what a massive name in um, production. Probably like the biggest producer of the 1970s. So um, I think just, and just seeing that name, it felt so exotic seeing him present all these films and King Kong. We just saw the, um, three, not three, three, three Days of the Condor. So yeah, Dino De Laurentiis, because I don't think there are any producers on this list either. And sometimes, yeah, they're... good point. You're right. I didn't put any producers on my list. Yeah. Um, Uber producer. Uh, my only kind of slight question about Dino yeah. De Laurentiis was um, D. It's a D the man thing. was not consistent. <laughs> no, no, no. Some absolute rubbish too. But it just <laughs> oh, again, yeah, he made some classics and he made some trash. I think he represents the seventies. But you know what? He made films though. Yeah, Qua- quantity, not quality, isn't it? Okay, yeah, yeah. M. Yeah, go. Um, M, I'm going to put so so for M, I put uh, and again, this is a bit of a stretch. I put Mel Brooks. Oh yeah, first um, I, I'm not mm-hmm. entirely sure whether he fits into this '70s groove that we're trying to kind of paint. In so far as you know, he wasn't entirely nihilistic. He was, he was, you know, I admit he was kind of cynical mm-hmm. and he had kind of a low opinion of human nature, but you know, probably justifiably. I only discovered on. Um, you know, doing a bit of research for the the poll, that Blazing Saddles was the second highest grossing film of 1974. Oh. So, you know, famous film, well-known film, tremendously successful film. Blazing Saddles absolutely coined it. I love you. Yeah. I've followed it up with Silent Movie, which I haven't seen, and High Anxiety, which I think I have seen a long time ago, that kind of Hitchcock spoof he did, which was okay. not entirely successful, but an interesting idea. What about Young? Isn't Young Frankenstein in there? Yeah, I didn't put that down on my list, but I feel like Young Frankenstein... I wonder whether that predated Blazing Saddles, actually. I, I might have to look that up. Yeah. I'm going to look, look that up. And then we, thanks to the miracle of digital editing, it'll make it seem like I already knew what I was talking well, about. Well, we, we need a staff to do this, to be honest with you. The, <laughs> our sponsors, our producers need need to get us staff. <gasps> yes, Young Frankenstein, 1974. How could I have missed that one out? So good, yep. so good. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Mel Brooks has earned his place, absolutely. Oh, definitely, I think so, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, okay, what, what are you going to submit for N? Sticking to the script. But I think I'm, oh, gosh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> oh, good, I love it when you cheat. Neil, Neil, Neil Simon. Yeah, I'll go with Neil Simon. It's, I think, for me, I think of 70s, I think of, uh, I, I got it, maybe I'm on a Robert Redford kick or something like that, but um, Barefoot in the Park. But that's actually not the 1970s. It's 1967. Oh. That's the one that I really remember. But um, Goodbye Girl is 1970s. Yeah, Sunshine Boys, Heartbreak Kid. So there are some films in there. But the one that I really wanted to talk about more was Barefoot in the Park. So let's just pretend that N never happened. And why don't we move <laughs> on to O? Oh. Oh. oh, there's a letter O. Okay. So I, O is such an easy one. Right in the middle of the 1970s, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Mm. Uh, Milos Forman, um, you know, such a memorable film. Um, I have anesthetized for electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and you know, most people's one view of electroconvulsive therapy is formed by this film. It's a shocking, terrifying, you know, dreadful, awful yeah. scene. Um, you know, the whole film is infused with that 1970s nihilism again, isn't it? Um uh, you know, the real uh, electroconvulsive therapy, you know, can be a life-saving treatment, um, and it doesn't entirely deserve the bad rep that it's got. But um, as a cinematic moment, it's an unforgettable little scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yet another entry for Jack Nicholson in this list. Um, he was a very influential, um, central figure in the 1970s. What have you got for P? Uh, Brian De Palma. Oh, yeah. Again, I'm on script here. Carrie. Um, Carrie. That's the big one. That was another scary one. It's a Stephen King adaptation, of course, um, which has been remade, I think. Have you seen the... There's a more I have seen Carrie? the remake, and, and I kind of wish I hadn't. Oh, um, yeah, no. Sissy Spacek is in the original, and... Um, oh, she is in the original, yeah. Uh, huh. uh, I try to remember who... Um, it's uh, Julianne Moore plays the mother in the remake, and... Uh, the name of the lead for the remake escapes me, but it's a, you know it feels like a bit of a lame, watered down version and a bit of a disappointment. Okay. Mm. Um, 
But I, I love Brian De Palma insofar as all his films so kind of exploitative and sleazy. Yeah. I, I, I love, he, I, people kind of talk about him the knockoff Hitchcock, which is, yeah, I, I think that's a pretty flattering way to refer to anybody. I think yeah, I would love to be called the knockoff Griffin's Hitchcock. Up, um, but I, I just love that kind of sleazy groove of his films from the, yeah. the 70s and then the 80s as well. I originally thought Blowout was a 70s film, and it's not. It's 1981, yeah. but it's, um, it feels, but it's it a feels great Brian De Palma film. He, he's earned his place in the, um, in the alphabet. Q, God, good luck with that, man. Oh, man, so Q-Q-T-A-Q. I really scratched my head over this. In the, in the end, I've ended up really cheating. Yeah. So I've gone for Quintet, mm. which is Robert Altman. Yeah. It's a Robert Altman film that I haven't seen. Yeah, I don't think I've seen it. Uh, so what a cheek, but I does mean I can squeeze Robert Altman into the list. Yes. Um, what, a, you know, what a great director, subversive, satirical, all these kind of loosely structured ensemble films. Yeah. That I kind of really envy that somehow, you know, the story seems to come out of nowhere. They seem to be somehow magical. Nashville um, yeah. from 1975. Have you seen The Long Goodbye? Um, uh, well, that's where um, Elliot Gould plays a uh, gumshoe. Did yeah, I? exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I love the original <laughs> book, which is you know Raymond Chandler yeah. um, book, uh, and and so kind of Elliot Gould plays um, Philip Marlowe. That's it. That's it. But yeah. he's, he's kind of transplanted into nineteen seventies Los Angeles, and the whole it's like a little bit formless, but Elliot Gould is just kind of so charismatic. It's very very watchable. And, you know, I just uh, yeah, Robert Altman's is um, you know, such a skillful talented director and so quintessentially 70s what have you yeah. got for r what are you going to give us for r r i'll stick to the list here raiders of the last ark oh which for me which that's not... the snakes one isn't it it's, that's, it that's, is that's, the snakes yeah, one yeah so, so we can... watched it again recently and it is still great and it's still this is the one where my yeah my daughter turned to me afterwards and said that was the most racist film i saw in my life oh, really? yeah <laughs> but um yeah. But it is a triumph of action adventure filmmaking. Yeah, I, it's um, for me. I'm gonna I mean, I'm a great adventure. I remember that seeing Harrison Ford, who I knew at that moment as Han Solo, also become this like um, archaeologist Han Solo. So I mean, it's not like a, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a terribly different character for uh, <laughs> for Harrison Ford. Um, but again, it's the snakes, and I think you know that's what I remember the most. And I I don't think I would naturally like snakes anyway. But after seeing that film, I, I realized I don't need to be around snakes at all. We're basically lengthening the list of animals that you are wary yeah, of. Yeah, this is, this is what this is bringing up. Hmm. Um, there must be something in whatever that letter comes next. S. S. Oh S. my God! Snake. Snakes. 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 Sadly, snakes on a plane was not made in the seventies. Um, I've chosen yeah. Superman. Yeah, yeah, of course. Nineteen seventy-eight. So Superman and Superman two kind of filmed back to back. The uh, Richard Donner only gets the credit for the first one, doesn't he? Um, Christopher Reeve, you know, just was Superman. Yeah. Marlon Brando, the mere presence of Marlon yeah. Brando, but like the kind of the the, the out of shape Marlon Brando, yeah. the Marlon Brando who was you know about to then go off and film a bit of Apocalypse yeah. Now. Um, you know, beautiful, lavish film, and not as cynical or arch as most of the other films in this list. But you know, but it kind of it knows that it's not cynical or arch. It's kind of trying to be the antidote to that seventies nihilism. Um, still very watchable today, you know. Christopher Reeve, still you know a beautiful, the perfect Superman. Really, what you got for T? T is Taxi Driver. That's a, T is Taxi Driver. That, that could yeah, be a quintessential seventies yeah, film right there. Um, yeah, seeing um, Robert De Niro. I can't imagine. Like, Jodie Foster, that's always, it always blows my mind that she's in there because I'd known her from some of the early Disney films, like <laughs> Escape from Some Mountain, Magic Mountain, Escape from Some Mountain. Um, she was like a, in, an after school special TV actress or, a, you know, a, a kid's film. And then all of a sudden she's playing um, a terribly underage prostitute in Taxi Driver. And that was just stirring. My God. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting film. I listened to a great podcast with. Um, the writer, Paul, what's Paul's last name? Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader. Um, um, yeah, where he, you know, he just, just this idea of a really lonely, crazy guy driving around a taxi. That was the whole metaphor for, you know, the, the sort of the, the disruption of the 70s and the a lot of the uh, pessimism in the 70s. And he got that into a film. It's just uh, and a great, you know, great combination. It's actually a really good Scorsese film, too. Um, for yeah. the 70s. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to say Taxi Driver. I like that one. It's a good choice. I, I've I've lost count of the number of people who've told me that Paul Schrader wrote the script for Taxi Driver in a weekend. 
Oh, yeah. So many people have told me that story. They kind of think, oh, okay, yeah. maybe he wrote a draft over a weekend. You know, that's you know, perfectly he, plausible. Yeah, probably but a draft. A number it. of people have approached me as if to say, you know, well, you, you can generate a feature film script in two days. Paul Schrader did it. You can do it. Go on, hurry up. Quick, quick. I've started the clock. I think from what he says... It would have been a cocaine fueled couple of days. So, Jimmy, if you <laughs> want to just do a line after line of cocaine and then write a script, yeah, I'm sure it'll be good quality. <laughs> yes, exactly. Would, would, the, would the script be any good? I don't know. <laughs> sure, it's the shooting script that he wrote. Oh, that's good. Shooting script. That's good. Oh, that's good. Um, you, it's, it's fallen to me. I, oh, man, I scratched my head over yeah. this. You know what I put down for you? This is so embarrassing. I put down undermining authority. Ooh, ooh. As, as a major theme of 1970s yeah. cinema, it was the time of undermining authority. Bit desperate that one, yeah. But somehow it felt it felt appropriate. Yeah, this is yeah. what 70s cinema is all about, basically, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, stick it to the man. Yeah, because the man is trying to stick it to you. Exactly, distrust of uh, um, government and whatnot. Yeah, for sure. What, what you can What you can give me for V? Moving on quickly. V V. Okay, Venice. Venice. Um, which was the location for Don't Look Now, as you've made here in the notes. Uh, um, there's a, oh, is Death in Venice from around that time, too? Maybe in the 60s oh, or what? 70s. Yeah, I think Death in Venice uh, is in there, too, which is a really a difficult film for me. But um, I've never been to Venice. Um, it does seem like a very interesting place. Um, Don't Look Now is... That's uh, oh, Nick Rogue, isn't it again? It is Nick Rogue, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember that. And that's Tom um, Sutherland. Yeah. It is Donald Sutherland. Yeah, he's making his second appearance in this list after yeah, um, Invasion after, of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, yeah. So um, Venice, place that I want to go to. Um, and because we've talked about Paul Schrader, I think one of his more interesting scripts is the one that takes place in Venice. I think it's called The Company of Strangers. Oh. Um, so I'm going to skip into that. That's probably the 90s, to be honest yeah, with I think you. That's probably, or at least be, late 80s, something like yeah, that. Yeah, because Schrader is such a uh, 70s guy, I think that works. That's a really interesting Venice film. So that's the Venice film that I associate with the most, though. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's a Fellini. We've been talking about De Laurentiis. So I thought I'd mention Fellini, too, but most of Fellini's films in the 70s were awful. And I don't <laughs> think any of them took place in Venice. So this is a conversation that we don't need to have. But the precedes w w w i could so i i was tossing up here we could go with woody allen but uh, you're having talk having having had a adele hanel mm. chat a couple of weeks ago i'm gonna i'm gonna just lightly skip over woody allen yeah yeah looking the other way and instead i'm gonna offer william goldman sure um so he wrote butch and sundance yeah um but pretty more significantly than that he wrote Adventures in the Screen Trade, yeah. which was like my and I'm sure many other people's first go to book when they were considering, when I was considering, well, you didn't think I could make a go of writing for the screen? Um, it's such a masterful book. Yeah. Now, I've bought it, I think, at least twice, I think maybe three times and given my copy away to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so readable, it's so funny, it's so entertaining. Yeah. You come to the end of that book. Um, feeling really inspired. I certainly did. Kind of thinking, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, yeah. Even though he spends the whole book telling you how hard it is to write a script, yeah, yeah. you still somehow get to the end of that final chapter and think, yes, this is this can yeah. be done. Yep. Where's my cocaine? <laughs> you get the confidence from the William Gold book, uh, Goldman book and then you get The Weekend from That's, Paul Schrader, uh, don't you? Yeah, Paul Schrader is a much shorter book. <laughs> a very, very quick read. <laughs> it's interesting because uh, my copy of... Um, Adventures in the Screen Trade included the entire script for Butch Ta Cassidy and the Sundance oh. Kid, which was pretty cool because I'd never even seen a script. So, and that was um, it was on the, the the book list for my very first screenwriting class. But in hindsight, maybe they should have put in just like a line of cocaine, <laughs> free cocaine in the book. Huh. That's one of the best selling books of all time. That cocaine book <laughs> it flies off the shelves. Um, Oh, uh, one of the great advantages of being the person who yeah. chooses the topic for the <laughs> popcorn counter is that I can choose that I will start with A, which means that you get the letter X. I'm, Good luck with that. Well, I'm going to do a little reversal here because I haven't, I don't think I've seen the Parallax View and I haven't seen <gasps> THX 1138. I think I actually oh, no. have seen. Is that Steven Spielberg's like sci-fi film? That, that's George Lucas's first film, isn't it? THX ah. 1138. Then I have seen that. I don't really remember it at all. And I don't remember their Parallax View. I, I, I don't think I've seen it. So I'm just going to turn it right back at you. 
What do you got? <laughs> or you could go to Y if you wanted to. I, think. The, I could. Uh, the only thing I'm going to suggest is that I do remember um, in between successful runs of uh, Close Encounters, uh, my there was a period, and I'm pretty sure this must have been late seventies when um, UK cinema chains did kind of experiment with x-rated movies oh i think there was so little to be made in distribution that for a while there would be little adverts that would appear in the back of the nottingham evening post saying that you could watch um you know uh, x-rated american movies at the odeon though i'm pretty sure the censorship at the time would have meant that almost all of the sex would have been cut out oh really so i'm pretty sure that those those UK screenings of X-rated movies in screen seven in the, the local yeah. Odeon have probably <laughs> been about 20 minutes long, something like that. Yeah. I think you were literally going along and just getting the plot scenes from these films with none of the sex. <laughs> um, the 70s were a strange time. Yeah. I'm going to step straight on to why. Okay. Um, and I struggled with this as well. Uh, but I decided I was going to go with Yafet Koto. Oh, wow. Uh, actor who appeared in in Alien. He was in um, oh, what was the Bond film? Was it Diamonds Are Forever? I think he might have been in. Okay, that kind of that you know slightly strange druggy one with Jane Seymour. I think he was in that Bond film. Huh. But yeah, nineteen seventy nine, Alien, Ridley Scott's first big film. Yeah. So his first feature was The Duelists, which I still haven't seen. Harvey Keitel's in that, isn't it? Um, and apparently after making The Duelists, um, he was going to make another historical film and then Star Wars happened. And I think he realized, no, space is where it's at. So then he went there. Um, and so, you know, straight off the bat made Alien, which is like, you know, a textbook of 1970s paranoid existential horror. It's kind of full of nihilism, terrifying film, all of that kind of depersonalization. It's full of rich subtext, still absolutely great picture. Um, you know, coming in at the end of the 70s, what a way to round off the decade. Alien, fantastic film. I'm always amazed that that's a 70s film. I just, I always think that it's got to be at least like 82 or something like that. But um, yeah, it's a 70s film. 70s absolutely. Film. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So, haha, you managed to sidestep X. I'm going to force you to do Z. Well, well, it's Z in this country, Z where you are, isn't Z. it? You know, do do yes. posh Americans say Z? Does well, anybody say Z in America? Uh, no, the Canadians do, I think. Oh. But would you say zero Mostel or zero Mostel? It must be zero Mostel. So that's why we it. say Z. I wouldn't say Zero or Zero. I'd say zero. Zero. Z- zero but Mostel. God, maybe it is. I never even thought of that. But I zero must- zero. I wanted to say Zero Mostel, but then I realized like, the big thing that he was in was The Producers, which is actually a 60s film, believe it or not. So, ni- <gasps> so 1970s, no, he was still doing me. stuff, but I don't really remember any of the films that he was in at that time. So I'm not going to... This is all to say I'm not going to do Zero Mostel, even though I'd like to. <laughs> I like what you've got on the list here, which is Zucker, Zucker, and Abrahams. But uh... the Zuckers... Boy, Airplane is 1980, and that's really, I think, one of their first titles, so I'm wonderful. I think they made Kentucky Fried Movie before oh, that, really? which I have not seen, and I rather suspect it has not dated well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Air, Airplane must have shot in the well, 70s. Well, we got, could, got yeah. It, kind of yeah. got a release in 1980. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. I think, you know, obviously, it's been shot in the 70s. Such a funny movie for a kid. Again, that probably hasn't aged completely well either, <laughs> but God, it was funny when you were, what was it, 12 years old? And so Something the first like time, that, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. I went to see that, yeah, as a kid, and I'm pretty sure 70% of the jokes flew straight over my head. Yeah, yeah. But I still chuckled a lot. You still knew it was funny, yeah. You knew still you were it was funny, laughing. yeah, exactly. I didn't understand why, but it was clearly very, very yeah. funny. And you had a lot of... Fact, uh, I remember I, I was taken to see this film for Andrew Curtis's birthday party. His father was my Latin teacher at school. Oh, boy. And I can still vividly picture him sitting at the end of the row. He'd gone, you know, with like... You know, his son and about 10 or 12 boys from school. Yeah. And I can still picture him chuckling away at gags that I did not understand <laughs> in Airplane. Um, so if it could make Mr. Curtis, my Latin teacher, yeah. laugh, it was doing something right. Yeah, it had to be good or not. Bad. So is, the, is, is there a take home? Have we, have, we, have we painted a proper picture of the 70s? Is there a take home message about what the cinema of the 70s was like in Hollywood? Mm, not from our discussion, I don't think so. No, I don't think we've done any good. I don't think we furthered the cause or the knowledge at all. <laughs> Had a good time. We have, we have named some films, though. Yeah. 
We've named a lot of films. We've, we've definitely we've, named some films. We've dropped some actors and directors and producers and um, spent wasted some people's time listening to the podcast yeah, this week. It's been another is... Popcorn County, all right. <laughs> That's a success. <laughs> Well, uh, this this popcorn has not got any fresher in the time that we spent outlining all those films. I think we should go in and um, let you, it is it is Clockwork Orange showing, so let's go yes. in and see that at least. And then we can come out and feel thoroughly depressed about the state of the world. That's appropriate, both in the seventies and in the twenties. 